Okay, so talking about lists. Uh, let's proceed here. We will, I'll minimize this. If we can point our, point our browsers to Blackboard. We've got some... Do you have anything some, fun on Blackboard this time? Anything fun? Always fun stuff on Blackboard. It's like a playground. Great stuff. All right. Okay, so we're going to head over to learning modules, and today's is obvious, obviously called lists, so this is going to be module 11, lists. Where are we going in module 11? So what I want you to, the third block down here is called lesson files, lists.zip. If you could right click on that zip and save, pull that down to your machine. desktop for now. Simple. And if you can extract that lists zip lists.zip archive, please. Once you extract it, you should have um, two temp two HTML templates in there, index and nav.html. Uh, you should have an images folder and a CSS folder. That should be empty. And the images folder should have a number of different pictures in here. That's cool. All right. So let's uh, fire up a code editor of your choice. I don't care which one it is. This machine has Atom on it. That's fine. Visual Studio Code, brackets, Coda, Sublime, whatever you want. Is there no CSS? It's empty right now. Yeah. Open folder. Select the lists folder. <coughs> All right. And so we should have the list folder with the that file structure there. Um, that's all good. So let's. Uh, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to punch this up to the server as well. So I'm going to quickly uh, just connect to. You should have a connection now uh, using an FTP client of your choice. You should have connection credentials to your web app for this class or to the DreamHost LAMP stack. Either which one. I don't care which one you use. So make sure you bring up your FTP client. Does not matter what you name it? Nope, doesn't matter. You should already have, uh, on, if, if you go into the site manager, you should already have under sites one of them for this. No, I already have one, but yep. I, I created another folder that doesn't matter what you name it. Um, so what we'll do is we'll use the, the, we'll use the folder called lists, and we'll move this folder into the triple W root folder on that web app. Yeah. 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 So you don't need to rename anything. Just, we're just going to drag that whole thing up onto the triple W root folder. So let me get connected to mine. Give me, a, bear with me a second here. Accidentally, because. 
because uh, Cup had the, the worst. I accidentally put the lock holder in the WWE. I don't know how to get back out. Oh. You did what? Maybe I just didn't drag it forward. No, you can delete it. I wouldn't delete it. I'd move it back if you can. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you just drag it, to the drag it back, yeah. So I should have comp 10,002. This is Friday. This is my Friday app. This is cool. So you may not need to do this. If you have your credentials already set up in FileZilla, you won't need to do this. I will take this publish settings folder and open it up in my code editor. So on the site, navigate to your triple W root folder on Azure. You should see a number of folders from prior classes in there, like the Vox model, the bricks, the forms, right? They should all be in there. And on your local machine, navigate to wherever it is you stash today's lists uh, folder. It is, I agree, it's not very, um, yeah. You have to manually refresh those panels sometimes. So grab the lists folder. Make sure you don't grab the zip folder. Throw that in the trash. Throw that lists folder in its entirety up onto the triple W root for your web app. So there. So move it from your local machine over here, and then you should be that should be live. So in order to navigate to that, so the triple W root corresponds to. I know I sound like a broken record, but. Uh, you don't sound like it, you are one. I am a broken record. So that <laughs> corresponds to this URL here. This points to that triple W root folder. So we copy that. Paste and go. Okay. Now, of course, we want to go into the lists uh, uh, folder that we just uploaded. So I go slash lists. And there we go. You should have a simple page that looks like this with frog appealed in the corner and a bunch of headings on the left. So that goes in there. Okay. By now you should be you should be getting pretty comfortable, you know, navigating the file structure that is the server and creating folders in there and, and, and understanding how that translates to a URL that we can punch in and browse uh, over the over the web. Okay? That's cool. Let's take a look at this lists page as we have here. I can ax this. And this is called index.html. I'll zoom that up. How's that at the back? Is that good? Is that, uh, see that back there? Bigger? Smaller? Good? It's okay? All right. Good times. I want to index, right? Index is what I want, yeah. And it should look like this. So I have a very simple HTML template with my character encoding, a nice, uh, a nice title. Um, we have an embedded style sheet, right? So I've embedded this inside the uh, the head section. I very often when I'm when I'm designing templates for uh, a web application, um, I'll I'll do I'll do the HT or the CSS work embedded in the head, and then when I'm done, I'll extract that. We'll do that today. Extract it into a file. But I, I like you can maybe you don't need to do that. I like having the markup right 
close to where I'm doing the CSS on the same page. You can have two tabs. Right? You can have two tabs if you want. So yeah, you can split the tabs, and that's cool. Uh, whatever you whatever you want to do. Um, so the body has a inside the body we have a header element, uh, we have a main element uh, with a few headings in here, subheadings. Uh, <clears throat> close the main, close the footer, small thing. No, no tricks, really simple stuff here. Okay, that's that. Terrific. So let's go up to step number one. We want to build a simple unordered list. All right. So um, under the H2 here. An unordered list, an unordered list is a compound element, so it has a parent UL element, for unordered list, and inside that it has a number of children. So each list, each child of the UL is a list item, LI. Um, frog. Code, hammer, snail. Oh, there. Okay. So um, now be aware, you cannot put anything directly inside the UL node other than LI. You can't stick an H2 in there or a section element or a paragraph. You will have broken HTML. You cannot. You can put other things inside the LI. We can have a heading. We could have a paragraph. We could have a link. You can put all kinds of things inside an LI. A list item is a sectioning element. You can put flow content in there. Okay. You can even put another list inside that. We'll see how that works shortly. But you cannot put anything between the UL other than an LI. That's the only stipulation. So yeah. So make sure. Hey, and, and and make sure you know that uh, that you validate your code. If you're if you're confused as to what you've done with the li, it starts to get a bit hairy. Just pass it into the validator, and and it'll tell you. Uh, so that's cool. So we'll we'll save this, punch this up to the server, and I want to upload index and reload the page, and we should have. I'll boost this up a bit. A simple uh, unordered list has bullets, or what we call disks. So just like word, just like a word processor, you hit the bullets button. That is an unordered list. It's called unordered, not necessarily because you've given no thought to the order of these items, but because it's not necessarily relevant that they are in a particular order. Right? It's just kind of a grab bag of stuff. Now you might. You might uh, sort these uh, alphabetically or whatever. It doesn't really matter, but if you're using an unordered list, the, the order of those things is not necessarily relevant. Where would you use lists in a situation where you wouldn't, like a lot of things aren't really clear. So where would you do it? Like an example of a place you wouldn't expect the semantic to use a list or an alphabet. So where might I use a list? Yeah, like where like you, you've got your shopping list maybe for like I think nav uses a few different Yep, navigation or but where list, would yeah. you expect to like <clears throat> where because I know you could probably get rid of things that just have nothing there, so it doesn't even look like a list, but as yeah. far as the HTML and the search engines are concerned, uh, where would it, where would you see a list being used that isn't visually visually a Visually a list. Yeah, because you can turn the bullets off. We'll see how to do that, yeah. right? Um, navigation is a huge part where it doesn't look typically like a list like you see with bullet points, but it is a list because of that hierarchical structure we can build into that for SEO purposes. Yeah. Like search bots like that. You did mention that, but you also said that there's a lot of, uh, like it's underused basically. Yeah. There's a lot of uses for lists. There is. Yes. So perhaps when we get down that, I'll get to this something here called user definition list, which is something which is a really really neat type of list that is just not well utilized. It could be. So that's cool. So uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, a number of things that this that that the that are done visually with the uh, li are there is a left margin or left padding applied to each of the li's. Some some browsers use a, a margin left on the list item. 
or a padding left. Um, it depends, but the idea that the default styling for, for lists is very, very similar, very consistent across all major user agents. So uh, obviously you'd want to style this and apply your own visual styles, but they do this just for um, to visually uh, make that unique or uh, differentiate it from other content on the page. That's cool. Um, we can also put nest lists with inside a list item. And, and we can build that hierarchy down. It gets uh, fairly complicated, but it, it's very logical. So the next thing is, what if uh, it was important that we um, lay out some content, and the order of those things is very is very critical. So in that case, it's the same thing, except the parent element is an OL, an ordered list. So we build out an ordered list element. And then within the OL, it's still a list item. So we just apply this. So in this case, uh, um, what did Frog, he, so his list was wake up, wake up. So what did he do next? Breakfast. Did he eat breakfast in his jammies? Yeah. He did, yeah. He wasn't in a hurry, was he? All right. So that's cool. And then he got dressed. Get dressed. And then he went off to Frog's house, right? Go to Frog's house. Now, in HTML 4.0, uh, you actually did not have to close a list item. So in HTML 4.0, we could open an order list, open an LI, type the content, and then just go to the next line and, and open another LI without even closing it. I don't like that. I never liked it. I liked when XHTML came out and, and said, no, any element that is open, that is a parent element, must be closed so that the node can be uh, contained, explicit. Um, but in HTML5, you're free to use other syntax. So just because, so there's certain elements that, uh, paired elements that you can omit the end tag, I will encourage you not to do that, particularly if you're, if you're just kind of getting a handle on, on building really good, strong, semantic, well-structured markup. I think it's, I personally think it's a good idea to close those. It makes, uh, it just makes for good habits, really. Um, but, you know, in HTML4, uh, you could also use all, it was, uh, a lot of people used all caps for the, for the tagging, which I didn't think was a bad idea. Um, but XHTML, you had to use lowercase. So there was actually, the, the syntax was much more rigorous. We can use, the older style syntax of HTML4 uh, or XML, which is very rigorous, but just be consistent. I would close your tags. That's the, there, there you go. There's, that's the way I think about these things. So we'll save that. So once you upload that ordered list, uh, you'll see that automatically the browser applies ordinals to that. So the list markers are no longer bullets. There are decimals. That's a good thing. Yep. We can use CSS to turn them off. Yeah, and I'll show you all how you can do all, anything you want with those. Right. What's important though is that this is a process, right? So this is. Let's say, let's just say you want to learn how to make eggs Benedict, and you go to recipes.com. They're going to have two panels, right? Two tab panels. One's going to be the ingredients to make that, and the second one will be the steps to once you have the ingredients to uh, prepare the recipe, right? One is an unordered list. It's not necessary. It's not necessarily important where, in what order you put the ingredients on the counter. You just have to have them all. But the order in which you take to prepare the food that is important. So one would be an unordered list, and the instructions would be an ordered. So you use an OL where it's important that those steps come in a particular order. You know, maybe, maybe suddenly the next day Toad decided he did want to get dressed before he ate breakfast. No problem. You swap those around and the browser, you know, um, it doesn't matter. These are renumbered for us, right? So. And I, I still, from time to time, see, I look at markup and I see people actually physically typing in the one and the two and the three. I'm like, 
It's an OL. Just put an OL in there. What the heck? Right? So, yeah, use computers for what they're good at. They, they, they're good at this kind of thing. It's kind of what they do, right? Yeah. Figure out a lot of stuff. Um, so an ordered list. It, an ordered list is the same as an unordered list in that you could put something else, another HTML element, inside an LI. You could put a heading and a paragraph inside that LI if you want. Um, you, know, you put a block quote in there. You can put other sectioning elements in there. So LI, list items are, 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 are also sectioning elements uh, inside an OL, just like a UL. Right? Same thing. <coughs> Step three is a definition list. These things are massively, massively underutilized. These are very, very cool. Um, they're a little understood, too, and I think maybe that might be part of the issue. So a definition list is something whereby we have a list of items, but each list item comp is comprised of two parts. There's uh, some sort of term and then some sort of description for that term. So like a glossary, like you go to the end of a book or you go to a website where there's a number of, uh, of terms, and each one marries some sort of larger explanation. That is a definition list, right? A dictionary is just a very, very big definition list. So a definition list looks like this. We start with the DL. And for each list item, there are two sibling elements. So they're not, they're not, it's, it's a bit weird in the sense that they're siblings, they're not a parent-child. So the first thing is the definition term. So we say frog. <laughs> In addition to, there we go, term, right? So once we have a term, the next sibling element is the definition description, or DD. So frog is a uh, large, slimy, amphibian, not terribly scientific, but you get the picture. Ah, uh, some of them are, maybe some of them, yeah, some of them aren't that small. Like I said, yeah. I'm not a biologist. I'm not a geneticist. I, yeah. You're just a teacher. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's a lowly teacher, right? Yeah, that's right. about it. <laughs> well, I mean, you're, you're college here. That's what I mean. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm no scientist. Let's put it that way. Obviously. So you can put, um, yeah, so the next, the, those two uh, function as a pair. So these two function as a list item, even though they're, um, you would think intuitively, at least I would, that the definition description would go inside. I have a list item, and then these would be inside this item to encapsulate the two, but that's not the way it works. Um, so a, a second term, we just follow it up like put a DT in there, toad, uh, end of DT, and then the definition description, uh, a warty brown. Right. Um, DT, we talked about a snail, and the D definition term and the definition description for a snail is a slow moving uh, mollusk. So, that, take a look. And so the default rendering of a definition list, uh, what happens is most, and, and most user agents are pretty consistent in the terms of their default styling. The description will be tapped in, and the definition term will be up against the left mark. Okay, just, you can change all that, right? You don't have to accept any of that styling. It's just there to kind of give you a sense of, of the underlying semantic structure when you first build the template. Okay. These can be used in any number of ways. A definition description, they, these could be used for navigation. They can be used to build a uh, wizard steps in a wizard. They can be used in conjunction with an ordered list or an uh, unordered list to build out a number of steps. Right. Uh, the benefit to using more semantically rich lists like this is uh, not only your search engine, your SEO, but also your usability, right? Maybe for assistive technologies. Um, this might be useful in, in, in a context where maybe the interface is, is audible, like in a car, right? You gotta start thinking about beyond the, the basic desktop browser. That's just the start. These, these things are, are, are being used. I mean, I'm, I'm in discussions now with another, another uh, 
uh, teacher in the, in the program, we're talking about using CSS extensively in Java and HTML. Right? I was like, wow, I never thought the day would come. Here we are. We're talking Java and HTML and CSS. Right? Not JavaScript. Not JavaScript. Java. So using this stuff for the front end, for the UI. Java apps. Cool. Right? The stuff, it just, because it, it's very simple. Right? It's very, it flows, it's, it's ubiquitous. It flows everywhere. Um, you can use it in a lot of different ways. So, but if you don't know these, these things exist, you won't think to use them, right? So, uh, yeah, if you have a, something where you're, you're listing out a number of things and there's a kind of a term and a description component, uh, like in the movie pros poster, you had a, a role like a key grip or a director or a producer, and then so we had the term was the name and the description was the person's name perhaps, something like that, right? It, it, there's lots of different ways that you can use a definition list. You can be more than one. So I can say thank you. Um, so, for example, Toad, uh, a warty brown amphibian. I can also go on to say uh, this animal cannot give you warts, as is commonly believed. Yes. So if there's more than one part to that description, you can add another DD. So both of these DDs, uh, if they are siblings, they will be attributed to this one uh, as they follow this one here. As soon as you hit that, so any subsequent siblings are attributable to the DT um, that preceded it. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. Yes. Yes. So um, what is what is it like? What are lists in general say semantically? Say, uh, for example, like say you're on Best Buy, say you're at Best Buy, and you're looking at the tech specs for a new graphics card, right? And you go down there's a tab panel there, and it's a, you know you go to the specs because you want to see what you can have a paragraph that describes all of those features, right? Or you can list them out one by one. It's easier to scan, right? It's easier to kind of visually consume. Um, it also gives, it, it also it also kind of separates that content out a little bit. So it's all just going into paragraphs of the whole thing. Again, those different keywords aren't assigned to different weights in terms of those heuristics for the search engine. So list is more than a paragraph. It's not more, it's just different. If you had, say, you're looking at, uh, I don't know, give me some sort of keyword that might be important for a graphics card. Um, uh, uh, dedicated RAM. Dedicated RAM. If you saw that in a paragraph, but also in a list item as well on the same page, the search engine might go, oh, that's, oh, they're talking about that in, in, in just general prose in the paragraph, but they're also listing it out. That's interesting. So then the, the relevance, you get one extra little pop up for your relevance. This is different ways of presenting content in ways that are, uh, in ways that are suitable for human consumption. So search engines are designed to look at the content in a way that is, is easily understood by human beings. They're, they're programmed to do that. So the way you build do good SEO is you make it so it's very easy for the human being to understand what the content is. That's how you do SEO, right? Because that's that's what the engineers are are they're designing those uh, you know that that artificial intelligence in the search engine to figure that out. And they get smarter at it all the time. You're not going to fool a search engine. If you're going to trick a search engine, you'll get punished for it. OK, so that's cool. So um, so that's our definition list. So sort of that. So if I have multiple D uh, DDs, they're also just so those would be attributable, and also, I mean, uh, visibly too. Those are those. It, it can be, it could be argued that uh, I don't know. I, I I would if I was building the default styles, I might put a uh, a little bit of a space after the last DD just to separate so these are kind of chunked together. But you can do that with CSS. You could say you know uh, DT margin top um, one yeah that's the only one line height that you want. You can do whatever you wish. 
These are just the, the out of the box basic default styles. That's cool. All right. So now we get into the more practical um, applications of uh, lists, whereby we look at taxonomies. So uh, a taxonomy, like I said, is a controlled kind of vocabulary that is used to describe an information architecture, and these are often used for navigation lists that can be styled um, using CSS and maybe a combination of JavaScript for, you know, the little hamburger menus on your phone. You hit that, it slides down, or the panel slides out, and there's the list, and you click that, and other things slides open, or, or you're on a desktop, and you hover over this, and the panel slides down, and there's section two, you hit that, and panel slides out to the right for your third level list. That kind of structure, um, before we build the interaction and the visuals, we have to make sure that the semantics are all the data is good. You want good data that describes, and so lists are very well made for this very purpose. So let's look at a specific case where we might design navigation. If you're building anything to do with navigation, whether it's global navigation, whether it's secondary navigation, whether it's supplementary navigation, I don't care what it is from a UI perspective. Surrounded with nav. That's what they're there for. It just drives me crazy. I go and see modern markup on current web apps, and I say div ID equal nav, div class equal nav. I'm like, first, you're just wasting bandwidth, first of all. People are doing entirely but the, here's the, I think this is the problem. What happens is you get, if you, you look at a tutorial, there's a lot of great tutorials out there. There's, there's all kinds of, what they do, if someone is creating a tutorial and showing you how to do something, the reason they use this is because they can't make any assumptions about the type of markup you're going to need in your specific situation. So they use this because they're generic. And what they're intending is that you're not going to take that code verbatim, you're going to understand what they're doing and put your own elements in place based on what widget you're constructing, right? You don't just grab that list of divs, endlessly div, and slam it into your code, and then adjust your CSS and put a bunch of classes and IDs in there. You're making it very complicated for no reason. Use the element for what it means. It, it, it makes for simpler markup, it makes for simpler C and more understandable CSS, and it makes for more understandable, simpler, easier to maintain JavaScript. So it makes people's lives easier all the way along. Don't make complicated markup. Don't make things more difficult than they need to be. Keep it simple. It's going to get complicated enough on its own. Guarantee it. If you're one of those people that just like to make things complicated to, to impress someone, I don't want you on my team. Right. No thanks. You've seen that, right? That's not cool. Um, yeah, keep it simple. So use a nav element if it's for navigational purposes. So, of course, inside the nav element, then we will craft a UL. Or, if the navigational, maybe, not OL. Well. If, or if the navigation, if you're building, say you're building a navigation wizard, maybe there's four steps to a checkout cart. You know that band across the top that you have step one, two, three, four? Maybe that should be an OL, because it's numbered, instead of a UL. But then surround it with a nav element as well. Right? See where I'm going with this? So, so um, this may seem silly, and I, I, I may seem like I'm overly obsessed with this, but it makes a big difference. It really, really does. Um, you know, people spend a lot of time building these specifications and building out these, and, and the browser vendors spend a lot of time supporting these elements for you to use. You know, use them. Um, so inside the UL, then we'll create a, a list item, for example. So, but with a navigation, if you think about it semantically, navigations are lists of links. That's what they are, effectively. So then what we need is a list plus an anchor, which is a link. So we put an li, and then inside the li, we put an anchor. I won't make any assumptions about the href. You should have a well-crafted title, as always. And I'm going to say frogs, end of anchor, end of list type. Now, in this instance, I leave the anchor in line with the li for formatting purposes. An anchor is an inline, it's a phrasing element by default, it's flow content. So, be careful though that you open the list item, you open the anchor, you have your text node, you close the anchor, you 
close the A and the L L I. It's very common for people to, to swap these around in the end. So they kind of have things like this instead of, you know, nest the, the entire anchor inside the parent element of the list item. Really easy mistake to make. And that's it. So that, there's no tricks to that. All that does is give us a list with a link in this case, right? So of course you want more than those, so we will copy out, copy that to your clipboard, paste a couple more. We'll have frogs, toads, plants. is a navigation element. <clears throat> I'm going to assume that you have these well-crafted, well-thought-out titles that describe what the user should expect should they click on the frog page or the toads or tails, and your href is either an absolute or a relative reference, inbound or outbound URL. If it's outbound, you use rel equal external. If it's not, you just leave it. Okay, that's cool. Where it gets crazy is where, okay, maybe we want, whoops, maybe we our taxonomy or our information architecture is a little bit more complicated than that. So perhaps our, our, uh, our site's going to contain, uh, we need to break up frogs. Maybe there are different types of frogs we want to talk about. Okay, this is where the power of lists becomes very clear. So I need to create a list within the frog section. You may or may not have a parent or an index page for the frogs, but we need definitely need to have, <clears throat> say, three different types of frogs listed here. So what I'll do, remember I said you cannot have anything inside the UL by the list item. So if I wanted to break down this element here for frogs, I need to put whatever other list I'm going to put inside that list item, not between the tags. That's broken HTML. In order for it to be a child node of that list item frogs, it has to be inside the LI. This is a very common error. So if you put the, you need to put the cursor just before we close the list item and just after we've, we've uh, completed the anchor for the frogs. So put it right there, then hit enter a couple times. Crack that list item open. And then for good formatting purposes, we'll tab inside here. So frogs, we have now a second secondary list, and we add, we inject another UL. Watch your formatting. So inside this UL, now we'll create another list item, another anchor with another title, and this will be, let's say, bullfrogs. Close your anchor, close your list item. Notice that entire UL and any associated LIs are all inside the list item for frogs. If it helps you, I might advise taking breaking this anchor to a new line. So you can see that the list item, start and end tag stay on their own, and you can see, okay, the, inside the list item I have an anchor, and then I have another list on our list, and then I have list items in there, if that helps you out. The crazy thing about all this is um, we add all this spacing and this tab on these tabs, it creates very beautiful code that's very easy to visually navigate, and then we throw it up on a server, and the server crunches, throws away all that white space, and puts all of your markup on one line, gzip, for speed, right? Yeah, so there are utilities so you might say, well, why are you making me do all this formatting? I want you to get into the habit of building maintainable code. I want you to comment things properly. I want you to format things properly. Right? Obviously, in production, we're going to move all this stuff to a very compressed format. Um, you'll see of things, you might download things like, oh, I want to download a, a JavaScript library or a CSS library. And they'll have a, a, a .min .css or .min .js on the end. That means minified. That means they'll actually get rid of all the white space and put it all in one line, right? That's good, that, that's a good thing, that's for speed. But when we're building this out, there's also utilities that you can get for most IDEs where you can 
you can put the code in your code editor on line one, hit apply source formatting. Dreamweaver actually does a brilliant job of this, one of the best ones I've seen. And it'll apply that, those formatting rules, and off you go. It formats it beautifully. Right? So there's all kinds of utilities for doing that. <clears throat> okay, so we, we save that. Let's add another, we'll add another list item to the, uh, you can copy this one here and paste this, uh, paste another one, let's say bullfrogs, let's say um, leopard frogs. Can't spell frogs. Forks? What's a fork? Frog, there we go, all right. Leopard frogs. That should be plural, isn't it? My grammar's terrible. Spelling and grammar. No points for you. There you go. No CSS. No CSS for you. That's it. You're being too naughty today. Shut down. You're a hazard on the keyboard. So there we go. Yeah. So that inside, so we have the frogs list item, which contains an anchor and a tile of UI, and now what we'll call a secondary list item or list with two list items, and then we have our code to show. We use the top level. This is the second level. And you can go deeper. I could put a third level in there. Let's see what this looks like on the, on the, uh, up on the browser. So the interesting thing about the, about the browser, right out of the box, it recognizes, it does a couple of things. Because the default style of a list item is to put a left margin or a left padding on here, and because these two here, are nested inside of this list item, which is frog, it tabs it in yet another spot, which is very helpful. Even if we're not going to ultimately display a list like in this way, at least it allows me to look at this and go, oh, okay, I get that. Um, also, it changes the bullet type from a disk, what we call a disk, to a circle. And that's great. So it just gives me some real visual cues as to the semantics of this. Now, it's very, it's very, very easy to break a uh, a multi-leveled, multi-tiered list, particularly when you add other markup like anchors and headings and things like that. It's very easy to break this. So always, 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 as you're break, as you're, as you're crafting this out, uh, keep in your in your side pocket, off on a tab here, your validator. And since it's up on the server, all I have to do is copy this and paste this directly here. And check. So you should get green lights. If you don't, it should direct you to the line number that is a problem. So we can go deeper yet. Let's say that bullfrogs, uh, we have different types of bullfrogs. So I put the cursor in between, in between the anchor, the end of the anchor for bullfrogs. So just before I close the list items, I have to build a, a, a child element inside the list item for bullfrogs if I want to change, you know, list out the different types of bullfrogs. So I'll enter a couple of times. Tab in, put another unordered list inside the bullfrogs list item. Ay, ay, ay. And then again, a list item, that's not helpful, a list item with an anchor. I don't know how many how many different continents are bullfrogs found on. I, I, I'm a little bit confused. You have two opening tabs with the UL, but I don't see. Do you see what I'm talking about? Yeah, and it's easy to get confused when you start doing this. Um, so yeah, so inside we have a, a primary list, and this is where it's helpful. You can do this. Watch this. I can I, I can open and close these. So yeah. if I close this. And I close this, right? So you can see here I have a, a lit, uh, the first, the primary list are the frogs, the toads, and snails. But this one breaks open. So I can crack open this list here, and now I have, I can also use comments. If the list, yeah, if the, if the, yeah, if the taxonomy gets incredibly complicated, it's probably very helpful to add some comments in here. 
I agree with that. So you can see now I've got our secondary. Frogs breaks down into another list. And then I can crack that open, and I can see a third list. I think bullfrogs are all over the place. Dang. You put it wherever, whatever region you find those crazy bullfrogs. Right? You see these ones in Africa? They're like, oh, yeah. They're like huge. They're massive. They have big frogs. Okay. Crazy stuff. Okay, so, so we save this. The interesting thing about this is no matter how far you go, um, if your list is structured properly, right? The uh, in this case, so the browser recognizes, oh, this is a tertiary list. So I'm going to, and it's a child of this list item here, which is all of this block here. So we add again another level of tab stop, and I change the list markers from something that we from these two again. How far before runs that list map? Think that's all you get. And then it goes back to the to the uh, GIFs. The, the, the GIFs, the circles, and the squares. What's that? What do you mean? What if there's different strings in both browser North America, South America, Asia, and Yeah. And yep. maybe you want to know, like, their particular habitat. You can go on forever. Go on forever. The point is, the list, the list structure can support that. In other words, you can go on forever. Change the rules, uh, <coughs> yep. Yep. Absolutely. I'll show you. You can do anything you want. Mm -hmm. Just because this, this is what you get out of the box doesn't mean that's what you have to have. It's just by default. They want to make it visually very easy to understand what you just said. And then I'll explain. Yeah. This is like the idea is this will be styled as a lockdown. That's so exactly what we're doing. Bullets will be turned off. Those are just like the in the HTML. Yeah, they're almost just for diagnostic purposes. There you go. There you have it. So, uh, what we'll do next is we'll take a look at the stage five. We'll look at styling these lists in different ways, laying them out, how we can change them, how they can be visibly rendered or manipulated on the page, and then we'll throw all this into an external file and then move on to building a drop menu system for a desktop app. So, uh, take a break. We'll grab yourself a coffee or whatever whatever kind of chemical you're dependent on. <laughs> well, within reason, obviously. Within legal, within legal parameters. Right? And we'll be back. All right, let's take a look at CSS. <coughs> How can we make these things look better? Because they... Maybe look a little bit utilitarian. Pay someone else to. All right. Someone will be paying you to fix it. Make it look better. All right. So here we go. Turn the wrap up. Why did what? Yeah, someone who's capable and willing to do it for ten dollars <laughs> and not receive any of the cost. Okay. So we're up at step five. So now we're going to move into the CSS. So we're going to go into the style element here. And the style element is embedded inside the head section. This is called embedded CSS, so it's embedded in the page. I'll build it out here, then we'll move it into an external CSS file after we're done. Where are we so, going to build it? So the first thing, we're going to go up to about line 10. Step 5. Step 5 is where we're going to style these lists. Cool. So first things first, so let's talk about a UL. So we're going to do talk, the selector will be UL. So the first thing I want to talk about is the list style type. So for example, here we have, um, whoops, we have um, our, our U, unordered list is a simple, uh, what we call a disk, believe it or not. So we type the list dash style dash type, and you'll notice that there are a huge number of options available to you, right? So we'll change it from, a say, a disk, to which is the default, to a circle. Okay, next one. Okay. 
And that is the, the and you'll notice also that the, uh, now what happens is this UL down here, remember that selector, if you say UL, you're saying every UL on the screen. So that's this UL, this one, and this one. So this is nested UL, right? So now they are all circles. We're being very descriptive about that. So that inherits. And it, uh, yeah, it inherits as well. Cool. We can change this to square. They're all different, yes. So, uh, yeah, your comment for CSS is slash star so no star line. slash. So there's no one line comment in CSS. Yeah, that would be cool if they did have, you could just do a double slash, kind of like JavaScript. All right, now one question. It's square. How do you make it the square, that simple square, bigger? Uh, you would build your own image for that, either an SVG or a PNG or a GIF. You build your own. My own image, the yep. square, and yep. then you link that. Yep. Yep. <coughs> so there's not only uh, not only square, um, disk, and uh, and circle, but there we can also we can also, if you want, you can do things like uh, decimal. Okay, so I can change the list style type to decimal on the UL. Now, the thing is, when I do this, you'll notice all the ULs are now uh, numbered, right? Uh, the only thing is, if you're going to use a UL, and you're going to go to CSS and change the numbering, or change the list marker so that they're numbered, I'm going to ask you, okay, visually, you're saying that uh, this, the order of these things is somehow important to the end, end user, shouldn't your markup support that? So just because you can change it to number doesn't mean you should. If you're doing that, I'm going to argue, use an OL then. I thought you were going to be like, if you're doing that, you have to take you out back with the shotgun. <laughs> no, no that, that, no, that would be if you use the center tag or the font tag. Yeah, but no, in this case, in this case, I, you should feel shame. That's what you should feel, right? So just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. Um, so we'll leave this back here at square, for example. Okay, so list style, uh, list style type. Um, and list style, list style position is, a, is an interesting thing. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to... Uh, First of all, we're going to create a second after the UL. We're going to create a, a list item rule here. So after the UL rule, create another rule for the list items. And I'll put a simple uh, outline property. And I'll say uh, 1px dashed red. So hammer in the, the highlighted code there just after we've completed the UL. So you're going to be able to see the list items as a box. Are Remember the box model? Either it's just me or I can show that. So what you can do is you can hold down shift and you can with the cursor and hit the arrow keys down and just <coughs> highlight multiple lines. Does this work on anything or is it just a code add whatever it is? Most everything. So we'll save that. Now what I want you to see the so we uh, upload this the only reason we're adding a little bit of uh, an outline so we can see those boxes. So now all of the LIs are red boxes, right? So I can see them. Now what I want you to notice is that the list style marker is actually outside of the content box. Right? It's outside of the element. So if I change this so I can say, all right, let's set the, um, up, go back up to the UL and set the list dash style dash position and put it to inside. Inside? Inside. Okay. Save that, chuck it up on the server. 
go. Reload the page and watch as the bullets now sit inside the box. Okay. Why why would they offer a control like that on lists with bullets? Well, I'll show you why. So this is probably I should probably draw some of the board here. So let's just say you have a I just say a paragraph and lines of text like this, right? Whatever. And then we have a uh, then we have a list. So you know, a list of items in here, and then we have maybe another paragraph below, right? So it depends on your layout. If you want these, this would be positioned inside, right? Whereby these are inside. If you do position outside from the default, the list goes like this, and then the bullets are outside the page line. I'm not really sure. I'm not sure why this is the default, but it is. Um, but if you have a block of content, and you want to, you want these, you want that nice huge outside margin, then you set these markers to display or list position uh, inside. This is a typographical tool. Inside or outside? There you go. Uh, the other thing we can do is we can do something called uh, list style image. What if we don't? like any of the choices for bullets. Well, then change it to an image, URL. And then so from here, uh, I borrowed uh, shamelessly, I borrowed the bullets, the star from Super Mario, which I love. Super Mario, there, there's the Super Mario star, can you see it? All right, a little bit tiny. You have to make them pretty small. So we'll go images slash uh, bullet underscore star dot png. Did you get your results caught for that? I haven't been caught yet. I'm sure they're coming for me. <laughs> you better run. They're on their way. Better run. There you go. So a uh, couple things. When you're building a custom bullet, you should probably you'll probably have to make the background transparent. So the you know the page color is something other than or, or at least the background uh, should match the background of the page. That image is already up on the server, right? On the images there. Thanks for the star. They look very fabulous. It's kind of cool, eh? <laughs> there you go. So yeah, you you can you can apply a uh, a different image if you want. If you don't like the bullets, whatever. If you don't like the if you don't like the uh, um, how these are lined up, for example, you see these stars aren't quite lined up with the the text. Maybe you want them to line up perfectly with the baseline of the text. Um, you can't use this style image. You use it. You, what you do is you add additional padding, turn the list styles uh, uh, type to none. So turn off the bullet markers, then add padding left and put a background image and repeat none. And then you can position the background image perfectly to where you want. So you can also do that if if you're that kind of crazy about like it's got to be perfect pixel by pixel, right? If you're kind of like you know, that kind of uh, hyper-focus on, on thing that just use a background image if, you, if that doesn't work for you. We can also turn all this off if I want. I can say list style dash type and I can say none. That means just no list, no list markers at all. So this rule in this case We'll, we'll cascade over this one because it's later. And that okay. shuts down. It said none, right? None. Oh, does it? Oh, maybe it doesn't. Maybe it doesn't. Uh, well, maybe it doesn't supersede that. Maybe that takes precedence. Maybe that shuts down. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Maybe if I have an image. Yeah, maybe if I have an image, and then, yeah. I would have to, I would have to comment this out. Test that. Up we go. Yeah, you have to turn off the images. There you go. Oh, so like not bullet bullet can be the images. Right. Yeah. So those. Yeah, it'll turn off the markers, but it will render the image. So there you go. I didn't realize. I, I forgot. Can you go back to the left? So even with the list markers turned off, if you have the image, it will show the image. 
That's all right. I'll leave the I'll leave the star. That's kind of fun. Okay, step six. We can lay out these lists uh, differently. So generally, the the default rendering of a list is vertical, right? Um, it can <clears throat> is is vertical, uh, and the reason being, if we look at these uh, red boxes, you notice how they go all the way across the page, right? So the default a list item is a is a block. Remember the bo the box model we talked about? It's a block. You, if you don't believe me, you can right-click on any one of these things, hit Inspect, and you can bring open the DOM, and there you can see, right, there's the DOM right there. Or the box model is right here. There's the DOM right here, the document object model. Not, so that is a list item. A, a box, something that's display blocks, or just say it's display block is width 100% of its container, and it forces a line break before and after. So that essentially that will stack vertically. We can change that. If we want this list to be displayed horizontally, we can control that if we wish. So how we do that, let's go ahead and um, for the list item up here above, we can leave the outline on, that's okay. What I can do is I can say um, float left. So this means um, Take every single list item, each and every one, right, and float them left. So this will apply to each and every one of these list items, all the LIs on the page. Float left is a bit weird. What it means is uh, slam it up against the left side of the page or its container or whatever, and then any subsequent content after it in the document will reflow like water to the space now left to the right-hand side. So the width can't be 100%. If I float cross left, the width of the element shrink wraps containing its content, and then the subsequent elements will move up and fill the space now left on the right. Float left, everything flows to the right. If you float right, everything at, subsequent content will flow up and flow left, right back, right back. Okay. So here I'll see what it, we'll see what it looks like. So up, upload this to the server. I didn't save it, did I? No, I didn't save it. You're very naughty boy. You're supposed to save it. You're supposed to save it. So there. <coughs> so this looks called crazy. What happened here? It's actually doing exactly what it said. So frog is close left. You see how the box is now only as wide as the content plus the marker. Um, that flows left. So then the next <coughs> item reflows up to the right. But it's also flow left. Flow left. Because all allies are both left. So it slams up against the left edge of uh, the right edge of frog, and any subsequent content, in this case the snail of the li, reflows up to the right. But this is also float left. So it slams up against the right side of code, and any subsequent content, in this case the header, moves up and reflows the flow of frog to the right. Float left. In effect, um, I've, what I've done is horizontally arranged these list items. We're using floats. Now, I don't want this heading to be up here. I want it to go back down where it belongs. So I have to use a clear. So I have to say to this, this heading, clear, don't render until we're clear of floated stuff on the left. So I can do that, and, and I say that is a, an H2. Yeah, it's an H2. So what I can do here is I can say H2. Clear. What does the clear mean exactly? Because it's left, right, and clear. Yeah. So what this means is it says look onto the left margin and don't start rendering the H2 until we're clear of floating elements. The clear right means look to the right margin because there could be elements that are floating right. Don't render until the right margin is clear of floating right elements. Clear both means. Scan both margins, find the per first instance where they're both clear of floated stuff, and then render. I'll show what this looks like. So if I say if I say to the H2, wait to clear left. So this should wait 
it should render over here because this is the first place where we're cleared left of any floated stuff. So there they go. And there's the floats. These are all float left. These are all float left too. Kind of makes a mess. Floats are weird. I, I, I'll admit that. They're weird. This image over here is actually float right. So you'll see in the markup, um, down here, this image is right inside, it's inside the H1 that says lists. So it's actually, it's actually right here, right? But what it does is it, our, in the style, we put the CSS right in here, and in, 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 this is called an inline style. It says float this image to the right. So this goes off to the right-hand side over here. And everything else reflows up to the space now left on the left. So float is, you imagine the content after it being like water, and the element itself you can put on the right or the left. Uh, nothing, I was being lazy. So the benefit is, if you don't need to, you can just do it in line. You shouldn't. The reason I did that is because I didn't want to, for instructional purposes, I didn't want to put other CSS in here to muddy the water. So I wanted to keep it fairly clean. So you actually kind of want to like, make it look lock it over the lock or lock it on the... No, not necessarily. Um, floats have their use, but they're a bit weird. We're, their floats and piers are not going to be used for layout forever. Uh, we're getting to the point now where uh, even production things like um, uh, Bootstrap, you might have heard of Bootstrap as a, as a framework for user interfaces with CSS. It's very popular. They're going away from floats and clears. To use something else to lay out the page. We're going to use uh, what's, what's called Flexbox and or CSS Grid. Which is pretty cool. And it's, uh, it's very nearly ready for Flexbox is production ready now. But Grid not so much. Not quite yet. So anyway, um, but I digress. What is another way to horizontally arrange a list? We can use something called display. So let's uh, let's uh, we'll comment out this float thing. If you put your cursor over a line of code and you hit Control right leaning slash, most code editors will put uh, CSS uh, comment tags on either side of it. So you can just kind of like disable code without blowing it away. Especially when you're experimenting around with, with CSS, I find that really useful. <coughs> just make sure you tidy it up. When you're done, though, you don't want to waste bandwidth with you know, commented out code. So the other way um, that we can render these list items horizontally, we can say display, we can say inline. So the default rendering of a list item is display uh, block, right? So they go 100% and they force a line break so they render uh, vertically in a stack. If I say display inline, that's kind of like, like a phrasing element, like an emphasis element or a strong element or a, an anchor element where it's like a word in a, in a, piece, in a, in a sentence. Or the words have to sit side by each with the other words on the same line. So that's called in line. So flow content is in line. So by default, a list item is not flow content. It's, it's a block. It's a section, kind of like a sectioning element. If we say display in line... There we go. So they sit actually in line. In this case, that seems to disable the list mark, the image list markers. But they sit side by each. So it's a little different than uh, float. <clears throat> the other thing we can do, the other option is we can say inline display inline dash lock. Display inline block is a little, it's kind of a hybrid approach. And that won't look any different. The difference between inline and inline block, inline, you can't control the width of the height. But it, it, inline shrink wraps its content. It's dependent on the content. It should be. Something sits in, in, a, in, in, a, in a, you know, you want to surround a text with an anchor tag. It should be the same width as that text. That's inline. If you say inline block, things sit side by each, but you can now control them as a box. You can now set the width and the height. So for example, I can go, now that it's inline block, I can set on each LI, I can set width 
and I can say 50px, and I can set the height, 50px. Because it's block. So it's like display block, but without forcing the line breaks on top and bottom. Ah, uh, this is weird. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Now I can control those. And they'll sit side by each. I'm not sure why this one pops up here. Can we go back to the Maybe a bad HTML. <coughs> Oh, I know why. I think. Oh, because this has three lines. And these have two. Yeah. Yeah, because they're they're all the, the text is all rendered on the same baseline. This has three lines of text, and only two. That's why. Yeah. I'd have to clip the display overflow if I wanted to fix that. So there you go. So our list. And you can position list. You can say position absolute, position fixed. You can move them about on the page. You can render them however you want. It doesn't matter. And they don't even have to be rendered in the order in which they appear in your markup. They're in a different order. Right? Further, further strengthen the case for build your HTML free of any kind of instructions that talk about how it should be displayed. Your HTML should be rendered in optimal uh, semantic order, right? Um, For mine showed up like yours. That's okay. Yeah. On the um, web, web side. Yeah. Like this? Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. These are sitting on the same baseline, all the text, all right? right? This is three lines and this is only two. They all have to sit on the same line, inline. That's the inline block part. So that's cool. So now the last step, of course, in this is we're going to extract all of the CSS, the CSS and put it outside of this document so that we keep that all neat and tidy. So what I'll do is I'll create it, we'll create a new file, so we'll go to File, New. I'll put um, CSS for lists. Put a comment in here. I'll go File, Save As. I'll put this in my CSS folder, and I'll call it app.css, pretending we're building an app. And then it should be up here in the CSS. Now I will take, I'll go back to my index, and I will take everything that is inside the style tags. Don't take the style tags, though. The style tags are HTML. All that goes in the external CSS is CSS. So I'll cut that right out of the document, and I'll leave the style tags there. Go over to app, and paste. You can remove the style tags. So go back to the HTML, blow away the style tags. The style tags don't belong in the CSS file because they're HTML elements. They're, they're HTML tags. Now we link this document with a link tag as we always have, href equal CSS slash app.css. And then the rel of the linked file is a style sheet. Now we've separated the CSS and the markup. Yeah. With the exception of this. I, I feel I feel valuable. That's so good. If you can, take those, don't leave any inline styles. It, it adds bloat to your code. 
If I just wanted to float that particular image to the right, I could give it a I could give it an ID, or I could use a, a very specific uh, even better I could use a specific selection that says header H1 image. So I can get rid of this here. Get rid of the float right on the image. And put it in the in the app.css. So let's go up and now I have to up upload the refreshed, the new and improved index. Also, I have to upload the newly created app.css into the CSS folder on the server. Be, be, be cognizant, be mindful of where you are on the server. And that should be good, except this is no longer floating on the right. So if I wanted to just have this image here float right but nothing else, I can go into my app and I can say, okay, let's look at this image is inside an H1 that's inside the header. So I can do this. I can say header H1 image. And I can say float right. And then I take that CSS out of the image itself and put it in the external style sheet. And that's very precise. That's saying only an image that's inside an H1, which should be only one on the page, that's inside the head. I could, I could even just say H1 image if I wanted. And there's <coughs> my image floating up there again. I can put some code in CSS. Yeah, they're here. No, the the height and width uh, uh, attributes are belong in the markup. That's a good question. You can't override them in CSS if you change the image to display block. So display image. Can you go down? How's that? Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. So are you just are display Images are displayed in line by default. Right. Yeah. yeah, they're considered flow cards. Am I? Should sort of admit that. Kind of dodged directly. Mangled it. Hopelessly, horribly mangled. All right. So that's cool. So the next thing, this is all fun and games, but how do I build, in all practicality, how, I, how do I use this list in conjunction with a navigation system to build a drop, to do something practical like a drop menu, right? How do I bake in basic interaction like hover to, and use a, a minimal of code uh, to make it, uh, to make it very, very easy to navigate make it very clear how to get around an application. Right? So we'll do that. We'll give you a quick break. It's 12.56. Um, we'll take about 10 minutes tops. Um, get up and stretch. And then we will uh, we'll learn how to build a nav drop, nav drop, drop menu for your navigation. Okay, so for the navigation, nav.html. So uh, each of these uh, this list is simply a series of links that hop down to the page uh, for four different books. So say Frog and Toad together. It just goes down to the page and, and each of these are, are different chapters in each of those books, for example. And so you can head down to a specific chapter in a certain book. So it's kind of like a page level navigation. So what I want to do though, I'd rather, instead of having this huge, big, uh, tall list here, what I'd like to do is have this, these top four level links horizontally arranged across the top in a bar. And then uh, when you mouse over them, each of these submenus appear. Only based depending on which of these top ones you've now you've you've moused over. And then of course you could use it. Once you mouse out, it will disappear. So I only want to by default show the top levels list item. The second ones I will display as drop menu based on the hover uh, um, behavior.
let's see if we can do this plain, plain old CSS. So first thing, what I want to do is outline all the elements so I can see them. If I can't see them, it's difficult to visualize what's going on. So the number of things that are involved in this uh, list, we have a nav element, because it's navigation, that's cool. Uh, then we also have a UL, and each UL has a number of LIs, and each LI has an anchor for the link. So there's three elements that I want to focus on. Okay, So up at the top here, step one, outline all the elements. So the ULs, we want to say uh, uh, border, and we'll say 3px solid red. Put a three pixel solid red border on all UL boxes. Copy that code to your clipboard. Then we want a also to style the LI boxes, the list items. Except change that from red to orange so you can see the difference. Or whatever color you want. I don't these are just for diagnostic purposes. We'll blow these borders away once we're our things done. And then the last part is the anchor. So I only want to style the anchors inside list items. I don't want anchors in the regular part of the page. So li anchor. And I'll what I'll do is I'll put the background color instead of a instead of a border. And I'll just say light blue. So I'll set a background dash color of light blue on the list item anchors. Any anchors that are nested inside a list item will receive a light blue background. Those, so set those three things. Now we can actually visualize what's going on. So I go, if I save this file, save it, chuck it up, chuck nav.html up on the server. So I want nav this time to go up to the server, refresh the page, and now we can see the three bits. So you can see the red boxes are the ULs, the orange boxes are the list items, and the blue boxes are the anchors. I'm not even close to that. Uploading all this. By the way, this is the Okay, so now go scroll to the top of the page. Okay, there you go. Yeah, that's where the nav is. All right, so that's all good. Step one is done. Step two. Uh, if you look at these things here, for the list, if we're displaying this as a list, I've got all these like nice little paddings and margins in here. And that's all very helpful, but I don't need that for a navigation system. Right, that just gets in the way. So I'm going to turn off all that default formatting, the, the left margins and the left padding and all that stuff for indentation. I don't want it. So let's blow that away. So turning that off, step two, on the ULs then, I will set the padding to zero and the margin also to zero. Some browsers add padding, some add margins. I might have to do it on the LI as well. Save that under step two. Chuck up on server. And once you do that, you'll see all those boxes now snap together. So they've all got, they're all just, we're not dealing with any kind of craziness with indentation. So now, that's better before. It did look better before, but we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna change the whole nature of this 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 element. It won't even resemble what it started with. So the other thing we, we don't we also don't require the list markers anymore. Those aren't those aren't helpful. So uh, step three, turn off the list markers. So we'll set list style type. Remember that we we when we're dealing with list, and we can turn them off with none. Step three, shut them down, not required. It doesn't say shut them down, it just says none. It says none. Yeah, it doesn't say shut down. It would be I cool, mean, though. Shut down. 
All right, up we go. That's cool. Uh, refrog the page, and look at that. Oh, they're gone. The refrog the page. Okay. No more. Uh, no more bullets. We're good. If they're still there, make sure you're uploading the nav.html and replacing on the same part of the server. Watch your t watch for typos or spelling mistakes. CSS fails pretty gracefully. If it doesn't, if you get the spelling wrong, it just doesn't do it. it doesn't give you an error. You know it, that thing that we did with the HTTP, it looks more better without the HTTP. I'll show you later. All right. Step four. Now we need to arrange these uh, list items horizontally, right? They're all in a stack. I need them to be arranged horizontally. Step four. Step four, arrange the list items horizontally. So we can do a number of things. Remember we did display inline, display inline block, or float left. We're going to take the float approach. So we'll say float right. left. You can float right. You can, we'll float left. This means all list items float to the left, every single one of them. So a couple of things happen with float. One, instead of width 100%, the they box is shrink wrapped to contain width auto, so based on the content. And then they sit, they will sit horizontally in a, in a, in a row, right? Because they all float left and subsequent elements flow up to the right, kind of percolate along. So if I push that up to the server, And that may look crazy, like, what has happened? It's actually quite logical. I'll show you by zooming out, so I see them all. What's happened is, keep it, watch. So each of the, so you've got, remember, you've got two levels of lists. Two levels of lists, right? You've got the primary list, Frog and Toad are friends, Frog and Toad together, Frog and Toad all year, Dave and Frog and Toad. Each one of those is a yellow, is an orange box. They are both left. They all sit in line. Inside those list items, I have another list. Those are all in a line. Those are all in a line. Those are all in a line. And those are all in a line. Lists within lists. Yep. My FTP is not working, and I need I unsigned out and signed back in. And I can't it's, just, even it's just broken. So you can you can do this locally. Yes. So you can uh, go over to the uh, go to where. Yeah. So right right click on that. You can do that locally. As long as it's um, you're in temporary, those are in temporary. Is that, is that what you're editing? Here? Go ahead and load editor. I think Adam is recording. I'm using brackets. So where is, where is now, where are you, where is this specific one? Yeah. It is. So let's go to your browser. Let's go to Chrome. Let's go to the side step page. Okay. Is that your desktop? Or your download? Okay, go to your download. Go control O. Control O. Go to your downloads. Go to lists. Go to download. There you go. Just save the page and just refresh it. Cool. So we have them horizontal. That's all right. Um, step five. Arrange the second level list vertically again. So each of these secondary lists here, I want these underneath this heading to be vertical like this. Right? For our drop, for our drop menu. So I don't want them, the secondary lists to be horizontal as well. Just the top level category. So I'll head over here, and this is why we have the select, look at the selector. This says any list item that is descended from a list item. So this will only hit the secondary level navigation. But the top level isn't inside an LI. Only the second level is. So that's why this is second level. By using a smarter selector. So what I'll what I'll do here is say, I'll say float none. So we can turn off the float. So 
Save that. Chuck that up on the server. Oh, there you go. That's helpful. I, I like it though. I, I like because I'm doing a screencast. When I right click, it shows that. Like for instructional purposes, it's a little clearer what I'm doing. So sometimes I do things in a screencast that I would normally do. I'd use a hot, I'd use a hotkey. Is what I use. I wouldn't even bother with the mouse right? in, in production. So <clears throat> anyway, so there we go. So now we have. Now we're getting somewhere. We've got each of the top level categories floated left, and each inside each of those list items, I have another list that is vertical underneath. We're getting closer. Okay, so now <clears throat> step six. I'll turn the word, I'll turn the wrap on here. View, toggle soft wrap. Now we need to set the position of the first level list item to relative. So the second level list items can be placed with respect to their parent li. This is something that's very weird. It's called contextual pos contextual uh, positioning. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move. I'm going to hide each of these drop-down menus off the screen. But in order to plot them back to where they belong again, I need to know. I need to be able to position each of these menus with respect to their parent. Right. They each have a parent LI. So in order to have the ability to, to position things absolutely with respect to a parent element, I have to formally position the parent. That sounds a bit weird. And if you, if you, don't, if you can't quite wrap your head around that, that's all right. You're not alone. It took me a long time to figure this one out. So what you have to do is just position the first, the top level LIs, position them relative. <clears throat> That on its own doesn't move them at all. It doesn't move them anywhere. They still sit in the document flow. But now, children, child elements of this LI can now be plotted with respect to where they sit on the page. <clears throat> that, doesn't, that won't do anything, so I won't worry about that. So step six. Step seven, now we need to position the second level ULs, these things, off the screen. I need to hide them. I can do a number of things. I can do something like called the uh, display none. I can do that. And they're gone. The problem though, I, but with hiding them with display none, is um, if you, if, if this, if this navigation system is being read aloud by a screen reader, display none means read none. So what I'm simply doing is, is I'm doing a visual trick to hide them. But if someone's reading this interface, right, or you're in a car and it's a menu where you're trying to navigate verbally in a car, you can't look at the screen. Um, now suddenly the person cannot navigate the app. So you actually create um, a bit of a, uh, an accessibility issue. I'm not sure that that is totally the case now. I think. User agents are getting a little smarter. Um, we can also use uh, visibility hidden, but and maybe that would just be you know just for that. But what I can do is I can position them. I can also position absolute, and from the left, I can go minus one two. Three. What I can do if you if you're worried about maybe uh, display none, so that. Maybe someone can't access this through a screen reader. You can position them off the page. So I can say from the left of the page, negative 10,000 pixels. So that means those secondary ULs, the drop-down panels, are off the screen into the parking lot over there somewhere. They're still rendered. They're just rendered out of the viewpoint. Imagine you charge out here and all this stuff. Yeah. If you get a, what the heck, Scott? Why are there like ULs out here in the parking lot? Yeah. So. If that looks like a little bit of a hack, it, it kind of is. Um, I'd like to see a better way to do this. Um, I'd like to learn a little bit more about current screen reader technology and see where they're at with visibility display none. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, so if we upload that, the same effect is if I if I render them, to, position them to the left off the screen, they're not visible here. They're rendered, they're just not visible. So now 
what I want to do is bring them back. Only, though, bring them back when the visitor hovers over one of these. And when they hover over one of those, I want to only bring back the child UL for that LI. That one they're hovering. I don't want them all back. So here's how we do it. Step eight. Oh, we already did step eight. We hid the seven level list. So step nine. Where's my step nine? Ah. Show the second level list when the parent list, I list item is moused over. So this is how this works. So <clears throat> we do um, li <clears throat> hover ul. What does that mean? So this means that any UL element that is a child is descended or contains a descendant of a list item that's currently being hovered over. Instead of left minus 10,000 pixels, as we put it up here, we'll say left automatic. That means put it where it would otherwise be rendered. Yeah, step nine. Eight? Step sorry, step eight. I, I didn't mention that. Step eight is actually this. Oh, so you were just showing Yeah, there. I'll you know I'll do this. That's gonna be a little more clear. Cool. So what we're doing, this is the the, the magic here is all in the smart selector. So this says you kind of have to use your imagination a bit. This means any unordered list, which is this one we just hid, we just hid, right? Any unordered list that is inside a list item that is currently being hovered over, set left to automatic, where it would otherwise be, instead of hiding it. What's the letter now? It's crazy. It is crazy. And so up we go. Upload. Refresh page. So what does that do again? I was trying to fix something. Yep, that's great. So this means any unordered list that's a child of a list item, so that's our second level drop down list, whereby that list item is currently being hopped So that will only be true for one of them at a time. And then left auto means instead of left, we need negative 10,000 pixels. Put it back, put the left position back where it would otherwise have sat automatically. Put it back to the left. Exactly. And crazy times. So suddenly we have a drop menu. Now it looks terrible, but we have it. Right? It looks terrible. It looks terrible. Let's make it look better. Okay. Cool. Step nine. Step ten. Set the anchors to function as full width clickable bars. So what we have here is a bit of a um, a bit of a usability issue. I'm going to zoom this up so you can see. So imagine someone mouses down here, and they click on dragons and giants. That's cool. Down they go. Right. That's fine. Now what if they click on here and they click on cookies? They're going to be like, this app is broken. It's wrong. Just go on cookie itself. That, that works. works. But we've created some confusion. Right? You can't have that. So if you're building a navigation system, it comes down to the anchor element. The anchor, the, the UL, which is the red box, and the LI, which is the orange box, and those are display blocks. The anchors are display inline, meaning they're only as wide as they need to be to accommodate text. So what we need to do is change these to display blocks. When you do that, they will automatically extend as far as they can 100% of the width of their container, which is the LI. I'll show you how this works. So now we go into the LI anchor. So this is any anchor that's inside an LI. Now we change the display from inline, which is default, to block. Then they'll expand to fill that LI, and you will have people can click anywhere on that bar, 
not really far, it's just a 100% wide anchor, and it'll work. And that's why I colored them blue, so you can see. So right now, they're, they're, you see they don't fill the spot, reflog the page, and there you go. Now, there's a couple more things and then we're all done. So, step 11, it looks a bit weird that this is only that wide, and this is that wide, and this is that wide, right? If we want to build a, a consistency for this user interface, we want maybe those drop panels to be the same width, irrespective of how much, how wide those text nodes are, right? So I can set a common width on those. Uh, if I want. So the LIUL, I can, the width is right now auto, I can set the width to 250 px, for example. Now no matter what, how wide the text node is, they're all the same width giving a little bit more of a consistent experience. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so that's cool. <clears throat> um, they're a bit small. If I was to, um, if I was to go, I'll go the default font size here. So they're a little bit tiny. What I can do is I can open up a bit of space, make those, make them a little bit more generous, make it a little easier, a little harder to miss. So let's go and change the <clears throat> step 12. Where did I put my step 12? Down at the bottom here. Oh no, we'll, we'll, we'll do a few more things before we extract all the CSS. So what I'll do is I'll go to the LI, <clears throat> I've displayed block, now I have all the box model controls, I'll add some padding of 0 0.5 a text size, so half a text size around. That makes it a little easier to use as a navigation system. Cool. <clears throat> Maybe we want some interaction. Maybe on hover of each of those links, we want to get some visual feedback in, sense, in the sense that something will happen if you click this. Okay, so let's go here after, just before step nine, I'll add an, uh, 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 a hover element. So li anchor hover. So on the hover, I'll change the background color and I'll change it to gray. And I'll check, change the color of the text to white. So now I have some basic interaction that adds a lot of life to the interface. Perhaps, maybe I don't want those ugly blue underscored links. Maybe I want the links. It's obvious they're a link. I now have built out all these other controls. I don't need to have them that default kind of blue and purple. So I can change that. I can say LIA and set the color to black by default, and also set the text decoration, which the default is underline, and turn off the, the underline. So on the list item anchors, change the color to black and turn the underline off. Then when they mouse over them, the background will change to gray and the text color will change to white. Makes it, gives it a more complete look. Okay, next step, 
let's turn off all these ugly orange, all the ugly orange and uh, red boxes. We were just using those to build this out. So we can turn all that stuff off. So up at the top where we did the UL, I don't need the border solid red. And I don't need uh, the LI, I don't need the border solid orange. They were just for helping me out. And now we can see Maybe I want that blue box to extend all the way across the page, even though the, the links do not. So I want to like navigation bar. Well, what I can do is I can, right now, um, right now, if you can see, When I leave on these uh, these lines, you can see that the see the red box. That's the UL for the top level, and it collapses to height zero. The reason why things uh, parents that have uh, elements inside them that are floating collapse to height zero, they have to to make room for any content that might be reflowing up to the right. They have to the parent goes to height zero. The only way to restore the height of the parent element, so I can use it as a blue box, a blue bar, right? The only way to restore that height is to also set it to a float or physically set a height to something that's the same as these other things. So what I'll do is I'll, it's just kind of crazy, but I, what I do is I want to set, also set the UL to float left. And this is a crazy thing called uh, set a float to clear a float. It's just a weird kind of, it's not really a bug, it's just kind of how the CSS specification was written. Set a float to clear a float. So if, if a, an element contains all, if all its children are floated, that element will collapse to height zero. And then, of course, I want to set the background color to light blue to match the other If that floating stuff, you're kind of like, man, this seems kind of a little bit like a series of hacks. You're right, it is. There are better tools coming. Flexbox, background color, and grid. So we'll set that up, chuck that up on the server. And then of course, now, now the UL, uh, the, the top level UL is, is height auto, so it now wraps its content. But we need to set it to width 100% because now a floated element shrink wraps its container, its, its, its content. So now I also have to say width Okay, now I'll turn off those boxes again. And now I've got a pretty good navigation system. If you really wanted to go hog wild, you can put a drop shadow on the on the drop the drop panel so it's really clear that, that is sitting on top of the content. I'll show you how to do that. So we'll go down to the U UL LI UL and we'll set a drop shadow. So we say box dash shadow. And this is a little bit more advanced CSS3. So the first value is the horizontal offset. Zero. The second is the vertical offset. The third value is the blur. So if we want to make a shadow kind of fuzzy. And the fourth is the color. You can play with those values and position and make the shadow bigger, smaller. Blur, light, so 
the actual side view on the side? Or side it doesn't have any, so a, a shadow is the same size and shape as, as, as the element, and then we offset it, and then we can make it, the edges fuzzy or not fuzzy. It's, a, it's a, like a Gaussian blur. And we'll see how that works. Upload that. Refresh the page. Then it looks a little bit more convincing, that's for sure. You can make the blur a little more generous. So I can say 10 pixels, for example. Then it looks a bit more like a, like a shadow. I got a problem here that doesn't really wrong. So the last step would be to take, like we did in the prior exercise, would to be extract all of this CSS, put it into a separate CSS file, and link it from the HTML page. And so completes CSS and HTML lists.